Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome back to our uh, Sabbath School presentation uh, 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 for lesson number six, uh, May 7, uh, 2022. Uh, we are going to talk about Abraham today, the roots of Abraham. And so, uh, as we continue with our discussion this morning, we are going to deal with uh, Genesis chapter 12, 13, 14. Uh, uh, we are now in the middle of uh, uh, the, the quarter, and uh, to begin with, uh, uh, let's have uh, the uh, uh, subtopics here, uh, but before we uh, start our uh, discussion, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, today, thank you for uh, allowing us to have this uh, uh, presentation uh, online and uh, Virtually, and uh, may it be that as uh, we begin our discussion, Lord, that help us to uh, present the subject that will clarify some issues that is going on, because uh, this is very important in our discussion on your plan of salvation, the roots of Abraham. And as we talk about the details, Lord, help us to realize the importance of this uh, uh, lesson in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, today, so uh, I mentioned here uh, <clears throat> the idea of our lesson today is that uh, uh, Abraham's departure on Sunday. Uh, we'll talk about some uh, questions in there the temptations of Egypt, Abraham and Lot, uh, then uh, the Babel collation, and then the tithe. Of Melchizedek, and then we are going to summarize it. So, uh, in in our discussion today, Abraham uh, was called the father of all those who believe. In Romans four eleven, uh, Paul uh, uh, in his writings about uh, those who believe, because Abraham believed God, and also in the book of Hebrews uh, where there is uh, heroes of faith. Abraham is also mentioned there in chapter 11. Anyway, uh, faith was uh, let most in his life always. Well, he, o- he also fell a few times after he was not perfect. After all, he was not perfect. So let's study the first steps in since existing Chaldea until the war of Canaan. Uh, we'll revisit the places where he built altars to worship God as his faith and trust in him were gradually growing. So, uh, from Ur to Haran, and this is very important here, uh, living for Canaan, uh, and then uh, going down to Egypt, and then uh, from Egypt, we came back to Canaan, and then, uh, you know, after they they went back to Canaan, there is that issue of uh, Lot and, uh, you know, uh, Lot and Abraham, where they have to separate because of their flock growing. And then uh, thanking God about that. So uh, in our today's discussion, uh, Hebrews 11.8 says that uh, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which uh, he re- would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So uh, uh, actually... Uh, if you go back uh, chapter 12 in our discussion today, uh, uh, you need to go back a few verses before that in chapter 11 to realize the importance of the background where uh, Abraham's father went from Ur to Haran. And there they stayed there in Haran. So uh, very important is because uh, with the story of Abraham, uh, in Genesis 12 to 22, we have reached the structural and spiritual center of the book of Genesis. Uh, some theologians have, uh, you know, uh, uh, build the, the, the idea of the concept where uh, the, the story of the, the fall in the book of Genesis now is beginning to be restored through Abraham. And the structural center is... Uh, Genesis 12, 1 to 3, where the three promises to Abraham in chapter 12 build on the three relationships of Adam in Genesis 1 and the three consequences of the fall. 
They also anticipate the fulfillment of those promises and the rest of Pentateuch. In Genesis, Abraham lives life without his past, which he, was lo- which he has lost, and without his future, which he cannot see. He, in many ways, lives life of frustration, one in which he never lives to see the fulfillment of God's promises. That is the essence of faith. It is to, to trust God based on f- sufficient evidence that he is trustworthy even when you don't know why or where he is taking you. So, migrants have been around, you know, uh, since the dawn of history. And the Bible traces the first migration to the first human being, Adam and Eve. And when he was ejected from the Garden of Eden, uh, and movement continued with Cain when he was cursed to a migrant for life. And when men of Babel were scattered over the earth, and now it is Abraham who must go. Not because of a curse, and not because he had followed his predecessors in doing something wrong. Abraham was not a migrant who needed to leave his country for economic or political reasons. On the contrary, Abraham left the comfort of his house for a place of hunger and war. Uh, The section takes us on a journey from Babel to the promised land. I will show you a map later on. Uh, But now with a hero from Abraham who lives his home without knowing his destination. And Abraham's first steps towards the promised land are not easy and rather hesitant. Abraham struggles to inherit the land when he finally arrives in in Canaan. uh, He cannot stay there because... There is a famine, and he, is, he therefore must move to Egypt, but Abraham cannot settle there, either because of the conflict with Pharaoh, and Abraham is obliged to turn back to Canaan and goes up to there again. Uh, but even there, things are complicated. Abraham and his nephew Lot, you know, agree to part ways because of a land dispute. Afterward, a war breaks out and involves the whole country. The very place that God has established Abraham. After the battle, Abraham is met by a stranger, Melchizedek, to whom he gives his tithe away, and acknowledging and nothing belongs to him. These episodes are rich with spiritual lessons in which issues of faith and ethics are intertwined. So, with the story of Abraham, uh, in, in uh, Abraham's departure here, in Sunday's lesson, we are going to read uh, Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 9. And why do you think God called Abraham, Ab- Abram this time, uh, before uh, he became Ab- Abraham, to leave his country and his family? What are the spiritual benefits and challenges of completely uprooting yourself, leaving your home and family and settling in a a strange place alongside people you have never known before? Why do you think Abraham brought Lot with him? And what do you make the double go in Genesis Genesis 12, 1 and and, uh, uh, 22, 2? So uh, let's read the text here in this uh, uh, context. Uh, There are, uh, the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, and as the Lord had told him, Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So he took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, all the positions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. And Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Mori at Shechem. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give you this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, 
who had appeared him, and from there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued toward Negev. So, this is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, migrating step by step, uh, by stages, because uh, you need to remember that he has uh, a lot of uh, positions with him. He is not that poor. He is rich, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, so let me give you a, a, a very uh, uh, overview of what he in the land. And if you notice here in uh, uh, the land of Or in Chu, uh, remember we studied uh, uh, the flood uh, uh, last week, and uh, the, the the according to the record in Genesis that the ark, uh, you know, settled in Mount Ararat there in number one uh, near uh, uh, at that area there, and then. Uh, if you notice, uh, Babylon, Babylonia, during a time in Ur, uh, was uh, Abraham's, uh, uh, you know, where they went up. And so, and then we, they went up into, you know, Haran. And so, here is a, a, a bigger picture. Ur went into, uh, you know, a, a, around Babylon, Babylon, Babylonia, and then went to Haran, number two. And if you notice from Ur to Haran in Genesis 11.31, <clears throat> the parents of uh, the father of Abraham uh, was the one who started the journey. If you notice, let me read here, 31. Terah took Abraham his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went out together from Ur to of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. So if you notice, uh, uh, it was Abraham's father that started the journey. And of course, uh, brought with him his family. And of course, his nephew also. Uh, and then settled in Haran. And according to the record here in Genesis, uh, uh, the days of Terah were, you know, and the uh, and Haran settled there, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So Haran did not go finish the journey. And so I, the question is, where did God start calling Abraham? In Haran or from Ur? You know, I, and so according to this background in chapter 11, uh, you know, I do not know. It, it doesn't say, but the, actually it was... Uh, uh, he, uh, Abra Abraham's father, Terah, took his son, the Abraham his son, and Lot, and uh, his nephew. Uh, so, uh, he, and then, in verses 12, 1 to 6, is the journey from here and down to Canaan, uh, in Genesis 12, 1 to 6. So, that is really uh, the overview of uh, his journey uh, during the call in chapter 12. So, the call goes, does not stand alone. The author of the uh, lesson uh, in his companion book, it serves as a basis for structure of God's call to Abraham. The verbs of the passage that refer to God's act are subordinate to the imperative go in Genesis uh, 12, 1 to 3. When the go, when God said go, he says, so that I may sue you. Uh, that means to say that God will only show if Abraham goes. Two, so that I may make you a great nation. So the fulfillment of this promise is depending on Abraham's response of go. And so that I may bless you. And so that I may make your name great. And so that I may bless. And so that I may curse. And so that I, so that be blessed in you all the families of the earth. So if all the families of the earth also will be blessed because of his going. And so, uh, you know, a very important context is the call is more than physical move uh, from Babel to the promised land. 
Uh, it also concerns person of Abraham, the meaning which involves Abraham himself, the call of Abraham to get out uh, of his country and away from his roots will take him to himself, to the establishments of his identity. It is not enough for Abraham to get out of Babel in order to find his real self. Abraham has to get rid of Babel that was still within him. And the idolatry of his fathers, of his fathers and the arrogant mentality of Babylon. So uh, when Abraham responded and went or left, Abraham is described not only a man of faith, but also a faithful servant and obedient to the Lord. However, Abraham does not go alone. The verb go is not attached to Abraham and his family. It reappears in connections with other people around him. In Genesis 5, the Hebrew word nephes, soul, cannot refer to children because Sarah was still barren at the time or the slave since the Hebrew word uses another word for the slave. And the Hebrew word asa, acquire, through his testimony. That means to say that Abraham was a missionary an accumulated people that goes with him on this journey. This making of proselyte is described as God's creation. So here from the beginning, Abraham's response to go to the promised land, he involves other people in his journey. One cannot go to the promised land alone. Abraham's response to God's go is not a selfish trip. It is a journey that involves first himself and then his family and then also his nephew and then others, the aliens who he meets on the way to the promised land. When Abraham arrives in the promised land, he does not cease his missionary activity. The first site where Abraham stops in Shechem. If you notice, let's go back to the text here. Uh, let me go back to the text. Uh, so that you can see, really see the importance of this context. It says in verse 5, He took his wife, his nephew Lot, all the position they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. The people they had acquired, that means to say that uh, th these are not slaves, but rather uh, the one that you know, he, he involved in, in the journey, and they sit out of the land of Canaan. Very important to realize that Abraham was already a missionary on the journey towards the promised land. So, and then, uh, if you go back again, uh, travel through the land as the site of uh, the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. You see, you know, the Moreh, meaning the tree of the teacher, which suggests that this location was associated with activity related to teaching. So right there in verse 6, Abraham continued on teaching, uh, you know, the Shechem, uh, Mori at Shechem. So uh, very important for us to understand that Abraham was not traveling alone, but also being, you know, convinced people to go with him. And so uh, that go, that's why, uh, that's why uh, should, that, should that be blessed in you all the families of the earth. So, uh, in this context, uh, uh, living for Canaan uh, took Sarai's wife, Lot's brother, son, and all the positions they had and guarded, and the people whom they had acquired. If you notice, whom the people they had acquired. These are not slaves, but are the people that they the convinced to join them in the journey. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So, God ordered Abraham to leave his land and go to Canaan. He also promised him blessings, honor, and protection. Besides, Abraham would be a blessing to those around him and all of the nations in his seed. So, uh, first, Abraham had to leave the land of Chaldea, closely related to Babylon, and reach Canaan in Genesis chapter 12, verse 5. We also called to leave the false doctrines of Babylon and to obey God's orders by accepting the salvation that God offers. So, there are spiritual 
you know, uh, uh, in t- in, uh, s- uh, uh, implications on this journey uh, of Abraham and on our Sunday, Monday's lesson. When there is Canaan, uh, <coughs> uh, Canaan is not an easy place to live. Uh, let's, let's be realistic here. Canaan is a barren land. It's a desert where there is no irrigation system, where uh, they rely on rains being, you know, as a farm, in a farming community. They rely on rain. And that's why uh, when, uh, when there is uh, drought and there is famine, because of lack of rain, uh, you know, this is what happened in Genesis 12, 10 to 20. Let's read the text. The question is, why would Egypt be so tempting for an inhabitant of Canaan? Why would God place his people in a land so unfavorable for agricultural success? In comparison between Abraham and Pharaoh, who comes out looking more like God? What was God's Abraham, what, what, what was Abraham's problem in all of this? What does the recording of Abraham's weakness and failure tell us about God? So let's read the text. Now there was famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a while because of the famine was severe. Now this is not the only famine that uh, recorded in Genesis. There is also a famine during the time of Isaac, and there is also a famine during the time of Jacob. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, in this context, we need to realize that famine occurs many, not only this time, but also many times in the future after. As he was about to enter uh, Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Uh, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but, you will let, but we will let you live. See, see, you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. And when Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into the palace. He treated Abraham with well for her sake, and Abraham acquired sheep and cattle, male, female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh, and his household because of Abraham's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham, what have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to my, my wife? Now, then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And then Pharaoh gave her, gave ad orders about Abraham's to men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Wow. So, uh, uh, if you notice, uh, it is ironic that Abraham, who just arrived in the promised land and was grateful for the gift, now decides to leave the country because he is hungry. Although Abraham had courage and faith to bear the threats of the Canaanites and remain in the land, he cannot endure you know, he cannot endure the famine. Uh, a, me- a number of reasons may explain this paradox. While Abraham felt close ethnically and culturally to the Canaanites, who were generally hospitable toward him, he must have been disturbed by the hard physical conditions of the land. This new risky environment where agriculture depended on rains from above and was in sharp contrast to the secure and stable Tigris Euphrates, you know, was in you know, valley. In that respect, the land of Egypt and Nile reminds Abraham of his homeland. The fertility of his land lies on a stark contrast in the land of Canaan. Moses himself would later warn the people of Exodus, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, 10 and 11, which says, 
the land you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot and in a vegetable garden. But the land you are crossing, the Jordan, to take position of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. So that's how Moses described the land of Canaan. And this was the land that God gave to Abraham. And then the question is, why did you know, God send him there? <laughs> question. And so it relies on the rain. And so, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we need to realize that uh, God, I think, uh, will send us in a place so that we are depending on him. We look up in order to uh, receive a blessing. Rain is very important. And when Abraham arrives in Egypt, he is confronted with the threat of Pharaoh. But instead of seeking God's help for guidance, he resorts to politics and lies. If you notice, in these verses here, God was silent. He was, he is not, uh, God wasn't involved in this decision. It was Abraham's decision to go to Egypt. God did not tell him to go down there. And so, uh, you know, uh, 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 it is precisely because Abraham lied and claimed that Sarai was his sister that Pharaoh took her into his, be- into his harem. And, com- and then ironically, it also is because Pharaoh's believed that Sarai was Abraham's sister that he treated Abraham well. And, you know, uh, uh, just as Abraham planned, the story is full of ambiguities. Even when Abraham lies, he is telling the truth. For Sarai is both his sister and not his, and not his sister. She is his half-sister. Even when Abraham is blessed with all the gifts of Pharaoh, he is cursed for his wife is now the harem of Pharaoh. God has not rebuked Abraham yet. When Pharaoh speaks his words, sounds like God, God's word to Adam, compare. And so uh, the, it is also interesting that Pharaoh asks a series of questions, just as in the call of God to Adam. And this is parallel between these two rebukes, suggests that Abraham's iniquity is the same vein of Adam's iniquity, lying. You know, uh, and so uh, the idea of... Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> going down there is that uh, to Egypt is that uh, because of famine and Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there uh, for the famine was severe in the land and when Abraham arrived in Canaan he established between Bethel and Ai and built an altar to God everything went well but there was a famine in the land how did Abraham change you know walking by faith Living earth for Canaan and then trusting God and then uh, being a blessing in Genesis 12, 2. But walking without faith, leaving Canaan for Egypt, trusting himself and being a curse. So uh, here we can see that God never left Abraham though for his lack of faith. Abraham deserved a punishment, but God showed him grace, the same grace as available for us today. So, Abraham wasn't perfect. Abraham, you know, is still sometimes has to grow in, in his relationship with God. And so, then after that, when, when Pharaoh sent him, you know, send him away, uh, uh, what do you think would have happened if Lot had chosen the hill country instead? Genesis 13, 1 to 18, a long, you know, story, uh, account, would Abraham live, have generously settled for Sodom? What does his story teach us about the importance of character? How is it possible to be generous with others when they are not generous with us? And why does God wait until Abraham and Lot have separated before he speaks to Abraham again? So between the living uh, from Canaan to Egypt and from Egypt back to Canaan 
until the separation, God was quiet. He, he was not speaking to Abraham about it. And so why does God wait until Abraham Lot and Lot have separated before he speaks to Abraham? So uh, let's read the text here because uh, very important. Uh, there are two screens in this text. So Abraham went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had and Lot went with him. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. I mean, silver and gold. From Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, you know, and where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, also had flocks and herds with tents and tents. But the land could not support them while they, were, they stayed together, for the positions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abraham's herders and lots. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So Abraham said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me and between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And then Lot look around and saw the whole plains of Jordan toward Zoar, well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. There was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of Jordan and set out towards the east, the two men parted company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived in the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are, to the north and to the south and to the east and west. All the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. Now I will make you offspring like the dust of the earth, so that anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length of the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abraham went to live near the great trees of Mamre of Hebron, where he pitched his tents, there he built an altar to the Lord. So if you notice, eh, after Lot separated from Abraham, God talked to Abraham. Now, the reason why there are some suggestions, the reasons why he took uh, Lot with him, because he will be the inheritor of Abraham's riches and wealth. But that, that was not God's plan for him. And so, you know, when Lot separated from him, then that's the time that God talked to Abraham and said, look all over, as far as you can see, these are the land that I'll give it to you. You know, that is really important to context here because uh, the idea of this, upon Abraham's return, soon he settles in the land, he encounters conflicts, Inside Abraham is a confronted with Lot's jealousy. There is a strife between the herdsman and of Lot and the herdsman of Abraham because of property rights. And you know, sometimes uh, Abraham's first tension in the promised land is from within his family. Lot opposes him on the ownership of the land. The biblical report indicates that it was because the land was not able to support them. And involving, implying that both were too rich to share land, yet the preceding information was only about Abraham's wealth. Nothing is said about Lot's position, which suggests that the problem resides in Lot's frustration and in his perception of injustice. Abraham seeks to reassure him because he senses that conflict is brewing. Let there be no strife between you and me. In verse 8, 
And Lot is angry and envious because he sees Abraham as the owner of the land. But Abraham presents the land to Lot and offers him a choice. The text says that Lot saw this land as if it were the Garden of Eden. And he chose it himself, which is the expression reminiscent of the wicked men before the flood. You know, and Abraham did not obtain his land because he wanted it. He obtained because God gave it to him. Two mentalities that you can see in this story are contrasted Lot, who is eager to possess, versus Abraham, who receives without asking. For Abraham, the Holy Land belongs to no one. And moreover, not only is the way, the way they go different, is, but also the way they dwell. While Abraham relates his dwelling to his relationship with God, Lot views his dwelling the only connection to himself and his material possessions. The difficulty of this co- cohabitation is not merely the result of outside factors. It is essentially also to do with profound spiritual divergence between them. The worldviews are irreconcilable worldviews. And so, uh, therefore, tensions between them are unavoidable. Although the biblical text reports a strife between herdsmen, the dispute goes beyond the herdsmen and involves spiritual matters. Abraham understands then that separation is the only way of peace. Lot takes the initiative and selects the territory of the rich plains. Abraham takes what is left and the mountains of Canaan. And like Lot, who decides by himself to lift his eyes and see, Abraham does this only at God's injunction. So, uh, you know, this is very important for us to realize that the coming back to Canaan wasn't easy. And he went back to Joni and south for a Bethel and the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I. So, <clears throat> God never left Abraham but took his hand and brought him back to the starting point. He gave Abraham that chance to begin his journey again, this time with new lesson learned. And of course, uh, Abraham no longer feared the famine or trusted himself. He had understood that God would always be with him, no matter what. Therefore, he let Lot choose first when the conflict arose. And paradoxically, Lot chose freely but became a slave, while Abraham was free in the promised land. And so... uh, That land was a gift from God. Abraham took it by faith. God promises and God fulfills. So uh, that is uh, our Tuesday's lesson now, uh, the coalition Babel. What the significance in chapter 14 is that it was about war taking place just after Abraham given the gift of the promised land. Was it an intrusion on God's plans for Abraham or part of the straining formation? Now, this, this is significant because if you look at he, uh, uh, in Genesis 14, 1 to 16, at the time when, you know, these are the kings of Shinar, king of Alazar, king of Elam, and Tidal king of Jogoyim, these kings went to war against Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Semember, king of Sabalon, and king of Bela, that is Zoar. Remember, that is where uh, Lot was looking into, uh, the green valley of the Jordan. All this later, kings joined forces in the valley of Shidim, that is the Dead Sea Valley. For, for 12 years, they had been subject to Kedor Laomer, uh, king of Elam. And but in the 13th year, they rebelled. And in the 14th year, Kedor Laomer and the kings of allied with him went out and defeated the, the Raphaites in the Asherah Canaim, the Zurites in Ham, the Emites of Shava, 
and all these names are very hard to pronounce. In verse 6, and who rides the hill of country of Seir as far as El Para near the desert? Then they turned back and went in Mizpah, that is in Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory of Amalekites, as well the Amorites who were living in the Hazun Tamar. Then king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Sibian, the king of Bela, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Shidim against Kedor Loomar, king of Elam, Tidal king, all the kings, four kings against five. So this is now the real battle. And then, now the valley of Sidim was full of tarpits, and when the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food, then they went away. They also carried off Abraham's nephew, Lot, in his positions, since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abraham, the Hebrew. Now Abraham was living near the great priest of Bambre, the Amorite, a brother of his call and honor, all of whom were allied with Abraham. Then Abraham heard that this relative had been taken captive. He called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went on pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them and routed them, pursuing them as far as Huba, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relatives' lot and his positions together with the women and other people. Wow, that is really, uh, you know, not an easy war. In the war that was mentioned, Abraham pitted against men of the land. The war begins with confrontation. Mesopotamian armies, including the king of Babel, Sinar, Opes, the armies of the land of Canaan, including the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. In the height of the war, Lot was taken captive. Remember? Lot was taken captive among the enemies of Abraham, is Shinar, associated with the memory of Tower of Babel. Now, this is the first war of the Bible. The contrast between men of Babel and Abraham is worth noting. The forces of Babel are described as coalition, all joined together in their politics and in their attacks. Uh, during the war, when Lot is taken captive from Sodom along with the goods, Abraham sits out with a band of men to rescue his nephew. At the end of his campaign, Lot and his people are finally rescued. The king of Sodom comes and to meet Abraham on the way back to the campaign and thank him. Ironically, Lot, who was eager to control his destiny and took the best part of the land himself, became a prisoner. Abraham, on the other hand, who graciously and humbly ceded to the Lot right of Jesus first, a choice that was his by rights and a senior relative, is now the one who takes the initiative to control the course of event. Abraham had understood that the trust in God and the readiness to lose his benefit was the best way to control his destiny and ensure the best outcome. So, uh, rescued <clears throat> Lot. So he fought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods. It's not his brother, it is his nephew, as well as the women uh, of the people, Genesis 14, 16. And so, uh, after serving Chidar Lumar and his allies for 12 years, king of Sodom and his allies rebelled against him. And the main powers of the time were fighting for the land. Abraham remained neutral. After all, he knew the land actually belonged to him because God had given it to him. You know, this is one of the issues that uh, causes war because of the land. You know, Land is very precious uh, to, to many who are, uh, you know, trying to grab lands in order to, to expand their territory. And uh, only when he found out that his nephew, Slat, had been captured, seeking first of all divine counsel, Abraham prepared for war. And so, thanks to God's support, 
only 318 men were enough to rescue Lot and to make the army a flee of Damascus, and God was exalted. So, wow. And here we can see, and the third this lesson after this, we can see the beauty of this story is that Abraham, who is neutral, became the savior of his nephew's lot. I mean, lot. You know, the idea of, uh, he could have said, heck, you have made your own decision, and yet Abraham was interested still about, you know, his relationship with his nephew. You know, only with his, uh, Ellen was seeking first of all, divine counsel Abraham prepared for war. He did not go on his own. He, he asked uh, the Lord about it. And so uh, the idea of this lesson is that uh, uh, very important for us to realize that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the... And then on our Thursday's lesson, after the war, and it's finished, and he won, and, um, you know, rescued his nephew Lot. Uh, this is one of the uh, interesting note that we can see. Uh, who was Melchizedek in Genesis 14, 17 to 24, and Hebrews 1 to 10? Why do you think Abraham paid tithes to his priest? who seems to appear about of nowhere. Wasn't Abraham supposed to bless the nations? How is it that this foreign king is allowed to bless Abraham? Why do you make our phrase most high God? What does the book of Hebrews add to this unusual story? What is the relationship between paying tithes and faith? And so let's read the text here. After Abraham returned from defeating Kedor Laomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out and met him in the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God, Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of, his, of everything. Now, let's pause here. Melchizedek, in a place where, you know, very um, unfamiliar, the first time that uh, the priest is mentioned, and the king of Sodom said to him in verse 21, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, With raised hands, he said, I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread and strap or a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing but my men have eaten and the share of the belongs to the men who went with me to honor Ishnol, Mamre, and let them have their share. Wow. So this is the idea here that uh, the, 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 you know, sometimes in this after the war, Abraham, the alien, gives goods to the strangers who fought with him and does not want to take anything from them. In this context, uh, the biblical author inserts an e extraordinary story of the gift to his tithes of all. It is first uh, mentioned, uh, you know, the tithe mentioned in the Bible and is returned to a foreign and unknown priest. Foreign and unknown priests. You know, uh, the reason for his incredible generosity is not given. The priest who comes from nowhere and will not reappear in biblical story, history is called Melchizedek, meaning uh, king of justice and Salem, uh, the ancient name of Jerusalem. He foreshadows the redemptive ministry of the temple and is also identified as the 
representative of the possessors of the heaven and earth. He is the, and he is the creator of the universe who just delivered Abraham from the enemy. This is just the first occurrence in the Bible of the word priest. Kohen, Melchizedek priesthood predates Levitical priesthood. The fact that Abraham uses the same title El Eon, God Most High, for his for his God as does not uh, as does Melchizedek, in which he joins the name Yahweh to the name God Most High, suggests that Abraham considered Melchizedek as a legitimate priest of the Creator God. Although Melchizedek belonged to Canaanite community. God had chosen, you know, him to be representative among the people of that time. And in spite of his foreign origin, Abraham gives him a tithe and is blessed by him. So if you notice, God works in a very mysterious way that in spite of, uh, you know, uh, there are still people uh, in, in the foreign land uh, where believes in God. And there is the priest. And in addition, a numerous offerings to God, sacred meal of the bread and wine and the blessings on him addressed to God imbue a Canaanite figure of Melchizedek with spiritual significance, pointing beyond a simple meeting of kings. Notably, the subsequent scripture maintained this spiritual connotations in Psalms 110 associates Melchizedek with the future Davidic Messiah followed the authors of the New Testament who relate the unique priesthood of Melchizedek to that of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 7. So uh, if you notice in Hebrews, it says here that this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the king and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days and end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains oppressed forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of the Levi who become priests to collect tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descendant from Levi, yet he collected tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is, the lesser is blessed by the greater, in the one case, the tent is collected by people who die, but the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi who collects the tent paid the tent through Abraham because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Wow. So uh, uh, then the book of Hebrews was very clear about the importance of this priesthood. It was a priesthood of no origins. So, uh, thanking God <coughs> in our nation today, and he gave him a tithe of all. Uh, God blessed Abraham. He is faithful. And, uh, you know, there is a relationship between uh, faith and tithing. And so, the, the, there is a significant contrast between the names of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Bera evil, Bersha in wickedness, and in the name of God's priest Melchizedek, king of righteousness. Hebrews 70. Melchizedek is a type of Christ. Jesus is the king of peace. He will soon return to bring peace on earth and to receive all who have trusted God and reach victory. And so Abraham showed his gratitude towards God by returning the tithes of everything he had given to him. He was an example to others, becoming a witness of God in his time. And so that is our lesson for today. And, uh, uh, you know, 
according to Ellen White in Heavenly Places, April 15, the patriarch obeyed. He forsook his country, his home, his relatives, and all pleasant associations connected with his early life. To become a pilgrim and a stranger, Abraham might have reasoned and questioned the purposes of God's in his, but he showed that he had a perfect confidence that God was leading him. He did not question whether it was a fertile, pleasant country or whether or not he should have ease. He went at God's bidding. This is a lesson to every one of us. And here is my last slide here today. When the Lord chose Abraham, it was not simply to be a special friend of God, but to be a medium of the precious and peculiar privilege the Lord desired to bestow upon the nations. He was to be a light amid the moral darkness of his surroundings. Wow. So, uh, you know, Abraham, even on his way there in Haran, he invited people to join him in the journey. You know, and this is one of the issues that we need to realize that, you know, no, uh, no one... Go to the promised land alone. You have to allow people to come with you. And this is what Abraham did. And because although he was not perfect, and yet he trusted God. And God blessed him so much. That next week we are going to continue our discussion about this lesson. Because remember that chapter 12 is a hinge. Now that's opening the blend. The, uh, you know, is trying to restore now the Garden of Eden in the plan of salvation. And so it started with Abraham, Abraham who is the father of faith. And so uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, li listening uh, and, and uh, viewing this presentation. That I hope that you learn a lesson that in this chapter 12 is very important in the plan of salvation. That when Abraham went he went because, and then the, the blessing, and all the blessings was fulfilled by God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you again for this blessing that you have given us. This lesson allows us to view the importance of your promises uh, to Abraham, although sometimes frustrated because it seems that it's not being fulfilled. And yet, Lord, uh, you, you give us uh, here a preview of what's going to come. May it be that as uh, we learn more about this lesson, that we will learn to trust you when you tell us and invite us to, 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 you know, to be a blessing around. Help us, Lord, to be, do, to be able to do that. And as we begin here today, May it be that your blessing be with us also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.